Hello and welcome to this video. So after the interlude of the last video where we set up the instrument.py and some of these class methods, we can get on with having a look at some of our analysis. At the top of the Candleplot notebook, I've imported instrument here, so make sure you do that. And then in the following cells, I've condensed the code up a bit just so it's easier to present in the video. But just as a refresher, we have our pair granularity MA list, and I've now added in a new variable called iPair, which I've set equal to our instrument dot get instrument by name and the euro US dollar. And in fact, now I see this, I realize I should actually put pair inside here. So I'm going to execute these first two cells, and that means my variables are set up. Then we're reading in our pickle, we're sorting out the columns and applying the numerics to the columns that need it because they were strings, I'm sure you remember from the previous videos. And then in the next cell down here, what I'm doing is setting up our DFMA so that we have our moving average data frame as you've seen in previous videos. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to test the MA16 and MA64 crossover strategy. We're only going to test it on the 4000 candles or whatever we've saved in our historical data. We'll cover more data in a later video. Now, if you're not familiar with the moving average crossover strategy, it's one of the many, many strategies that are presented on many Forex websites like this one, Baby Pips. And somewhere down this page, it gives us an image of how the strategy works. So again, it's one of the most basic strategies you come across, but you have a short and a long moving average. Here they present the 10 and the 20. We're using 16 and 64. And when the short one crosses over the long one, you enter a trade and the direction of your trade depends on the direction of the cross. So here the cross is a negative one because it's crossing down. And the idea is you would sell here and then you will come out of your trade when it recrosses and you would put a buy on. And when you look at the image like this, you're convinced very quickly that uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I can tell you in this image as well, if you look on the left hand side here, there's actually a cross going on there and another cross going there, both of which would have huge losses. But of course, they don't mention this when looking at this image. So back into our notebook, let's see how we can test this out. Now, the reason I chose the moving average cross as the first one to, to look at is because it's actually the easiest. Normally when we test out strategies, we have to walk through prices candle by candle. And actually later on you'll see we'll actually not be satisfied with walking through, say, every hour's closing price. We'll want a finer grain than that. So we'll actually have to find a way of getting, say, five minute candles and splitting up our hour candles and analyzing the prices that way. But with the moving average cross where you simply enter and exit on every one of your crosses, it's pretty easy to analyze the effectiveness of the strategy. So going down to the is trade here, I want to change this function a little bit. We're going to make the returning a one here if diff is greater than zero and diff previous less than zeros, because that would be then a cross to a buy. And we're going to change this one here to a minus one because it's a sell. And then we'll change this return to a zero, indicating that there was no trade. And that means in the code that where we've got this DF, the, the trades data frame is the moving average data frame where is trade equals to true. We now want to set that to not equal to zero. So it's either one or minus one. So when I execute that cell, I get my trades data frame. And what you can see then on the right hand side is now it indicates to us all of the buys and sells. So how are we going to assess the performance of this strategy? Well, one thing I want to say up front in this video is we're not going to deal with spread yet. We will do later on, but let's just pretend there's no spread in the trade. So we're going to look purely at the gains made cross to cross. Well, we need to get some kind of delta. So if you take the line 62 here, and look at this, it's a buy. The buy was made at this price here, 1.1337, and then we came out of the trade at 1.12593. So what we want is this delta here, the 1.12593 minus the 1337. And the good news is in pandas, as usual, this kind of thing is pretty easy to do. We can use something called diff. So we're going to type df trades, open square brackets, and then delta for our column name is equal to df trades dot mid underscore c dot diff. So when I execute this, we get a new column called delta. And what diff is doing is it's simply taking the difference between the value for the column you specified and uh, in the current row and the previous row. So taking our 62 here, what we get as our diff here, our delta is the 1.3337 minus the 1.12988. Now I have my price delta here, but I'd actually like my delta in pips because I see that people always use pips. So if we go out to the top of the notebook, you'll see that we've got our pair here, which is our instrument class, which has a property on it called the pip location. And we can use this pip location then to calculate the actual pips delta. So I'm going to put some brackets around this, and then I'm going to divide this by our ipair.pip location. And now if I rerun this again, now you can see that our delta has turned into pips. 
Now there is one glaring error in this, which I'm sure you've seen. I mentioned that this buy trade here, line 62, will go on here, but will come out here. But the delta we've got in the delta column is between these two prices here, row 12 and 62. So to get the actual deltas for each trade, we need to shift the delta column upwards one. So we'll type shift and minus one. And now you can see that we have the deltas in the correct places for our trades. The next step we'll want to do is calculate the actual gain on our trades. Now you have to remember that in the case of a cell, what we're actually looking for is a negative delta for the trade to be successful. And that's why we've put the cell as a minus one. So we can type data frame trades and then gain for our new column is equal to our DF trades delta multiplied by DF trades is trade. And this now gives us a new column, which gives us the gain. So if we have a look at this famous line 62, we went in with a buy at 1337. We came out of our buy at a lower price. So we've lost on this trade. And you can see that we lose the 74 pips. It's a minus. And in fact, you can see that the gains are very often minus. So if we have a look at this one, which is a sell here, we sold at 12988. And then we came out of the trade at 13337. So this one was also a loss. So let's have a look then just for the whole data frame for the euro US dollar since June or so last year, just how well our strategy of crossing the 16 and the 64 has done. And to do that, we can type DF trades gain and sum. And we can see that we actually gain over the full period of time, a hundred pips. So it looks like our strategy is actually quite good. Let's go back up to the top and just take another pair. Let's take the pound and the yen. Now, in my I haven't looked at this or pre-prepared this. So in my experience, this one can also be quite good with moving average crossovers because it's been very volatile the last few years. So as we flick through the cells, you can see the prices have now changed completely from what they were. Let's just execute the cells. We've got another set of trades here and let's run these two cells again. And we can see with the pound and the yen, we actually gain 292 pips over the last few months or so, or since June last year. So that one's looking pretty good as well. Let's take one more before we have a look at some statistics on the actual trades. Let's take the Canadian dollar against the Swiss franc. And now I think, and again, I haven't pre-prepared this, but I probably we're going to see a slightly worse result here. So we get our trades, let's execute everything. And indeed we lose 900 pips just on that one alone in the same period. So it'd be interesting to know maybe why are we losing so strongly on a strategy which, according to baby pips, is absolutely fantastic. Well, let's go and have a look at some of the trades very quickly. And this is why it's useful to have been able to make some kind of plotting inside our notebook. I'm just going to run the dftrades.head up here so we can see some of the gains. And we can see already from index 112, things are not looking so good. So let's go and take candles around index 112. So for our plots then, we'll take DFMA and we'll start at 100, uh, we'll start at 100 and we'll go up to 250 for now. And then we can plot this information on a candle chart and take a look. And what you can see is a classic problem with the moving average strategy. This here where it's flat is a weekend. So if we have a look at this cross here, this would have been a sell. And that means we would have sold actually on this candle here. And then it finally crosses back here. And that means we would have come out of the trade up here. So we've definitely lost on that one. And now we'd have made a buy here. And we'd have come out of that buy. And we've actually come out of the buy after the cross down here. And this is the thing about when you first look at these moving average crossing charts, your eyes tell you this, this can't lose. They're always winning. But you actually have to look at the prices at where the crosses occur because they're often very far away from the actual moving average line itself. Let's move on a little bit just to have a look at maybe 250 and up to 450. So here we have a cross here where the buy eventually occurred after the cross, probably around here. And then we've come back out though down here. So we've lost again on this one, even though visually it looks like we must win. And this pattern kind of repeats itself very, very often. And I find particularly with pairs, and that's why I chose a Canadian dollar and Swiss franc, particularly with the Swiss franc, these uh, strategies tend to fail a lot. You need things that move a lot strongly in, in the directions they're moving. The Swiss franc tends to oscillate quite a lot. Anyway, so that gives you an idea of just how easy it is to start testing out the strategy. What I'd like to do in the next video is expand on this and let's make a script and actually loop through lots of combinations and see if we can find some kind of optimum for 
some currency pairs. So I hope you found that interesting and eye-opening and thanks very much for watching. Comments and questions are welcome as always. Otherwise, see you in the next video.